Good evening and welcome to Vatican Connections. I'm your host, Noel Okel. Well, we're back for another week of the latest behind the scenes stories directly from the Vatican. And since our last show, a lot of interesting things have happened in Rome, so let's just get right into it. Here now are just some of the stories I have for you in tonight's show. The Pope's inner circle, known as the C9, just got smaller, and I'll tell you why. 2019, it's shaping up to be a very busy year for the pontiff with a bunch of apostolic trips booked and confirmed. And we'll look at where the Pope will be racking up his air mile points next year. Now, about those monthly prayer intention videos that the Pope issues every month. Ever notice a theme in the past three years? Well, we certainly have. And this week in the history of the Vatican, we look at the interesting life of the first Pope who resigned on December 13th, 1294. And all those stories and more are coming up next on Vatican Connection, so be sure to stay tuned. Okay, let's begin, shall we, with a quick look at some of the main events that happened at the Vatican over the past few days, starting with, well, the Pope's birthday. Yes, indeed, the Holy Father celebrated his 82nd birthday on Monday with dozens of children, their parents, and volunteers of the St. Martha Medical Clinic, a Vatican charity that provides special help to mothers and children in need. Have a look. Papa Francesco. Sunday, the day before Pope Francis turned 82, he held a celebration with children and staff of the Vatican's free pediatric clinic. Papa Francesco. E lavorare con i bambini non è facile, ma ci insegna tanto. A me insegna una cosa, che per capire la realtà della vita bisogna abbassarsi the Pope added that the proud and haughty would never understand life fully because they are incapable of lowering themselves. And on this third Sunday at Advent, during his weekly Angelus address, the Pope blessed the Bambinelli and said that the third Sunday at Advent invites us to be joyful. Speaking from the window of his study at the Apostolic Palace, the Pope told the crowds that, when you gather in your homes in prayer, look at the child Jesus in the manger. You will feel the amazement at the great mystery of God made man. This, he said, is the true Christmas. Cari bambini, quando nelle vostre case vi raccoglierete in preghiera davanti al presepe, fissando lo sguardo su Gesù bambino sentirete lo stupore. Voi mi chiederete cosa significa lo stupore. È un sentimento più forte e più di un'emozione comune. Vuoi vedere Dio, lo stupore. Stupore per il grande mistero di Dio fatto uomo. E lo Spirito Santo vi metterà nel cuore l'umiltà, la tenerezza e la bontà di Gesù. Gesù è buono, Gesù è tenero, Gesù è umile. Questo è il vero Natale. Non dimenticatevi. Che sia per sì, che sia così, Per voi e per i vostri familiari. Io benedico tutti i bambinelli. Also from the Vatican on Saturday, the Paul VI Hall was the venue for the annual Vatican Christmas concert. And again this year, it once again hosted an impressive lineup of international artists. Have a look. It's been 25 years since the first Christmas charity concert was organized in the Vatican, and over that time, Italian and international artists such as Andrea Bocelli, the Cranberries, and B.B. King have taken to the stage to raise money for worthy causes. 
This year, the Paul VI Hall is the setting for this event, which boasts an impressive lineup of musical talent. There will be performances by American singer Anastasia, Italian performer Alessandra Amoroso, Dee Dee Bridgewater, and the New Direction Tennessee State Gospel Choir. The theme for this 2018 concert is refugees, and the proceeds from this evening of entertainment will go to the Don Bosco mission dedicated to the education of South Sudanese children in a refugee camp in Palabek, Uganda. Another organization that will benefit is the Escuelas Ocorrentes, who educate children in Erbil in Iraqi Kurdistan, where 130,000 Christians are refugees. Okay, the main headline hitting all the news agencies from the Vatican last week is the announcement that the Pope terminated the services of three cardinals who for the past five years were members of his closest inner circle known as the C9 or also the Council of Cardinal Advisors. Two of the cardinals are embroiled in abuse scandals in their own countries while the third has almost reached the age of 80 and has not been able to participate in recent meetings. Now, the director of the Vatican Press Office, Greg Burke, spoke to journalists on Thursday, giving a quick summary of the issues that were addressed during the Council's December meeting with the Pope. And he tells us for now who's no longer part of the C9 and how it all went down. The Pope's uh, Council of Cardinal Advisors just finished their December meeting. Uh, there were a few important things. The first of all was that uh, the Pope in October had written to three of the cardinals, three of the more elderly cardinals, uh, thanking them for the work that is Cardinal Pell from Australia, Cardinal Erasuis from Chile, and uh, also Cardinal Monsuengo uh, of Congo. So um, after a five-year term, these three have now passed out. For the moment, uh, the Pope has not named new cardinals in their place. Uh, some important themes uh, of the meeting were the containment of cost of the Holy See, uh, especially by Cardinal Marx, the upcoming meeting of the Presidents of Episcopal Conferences, which will take place in February. Also, the new Apostolic Constitution, the document concerning uh, the Curia, Roma, Roma, the Roman Curia, and also the Dicastery for Communications. Now, uh, Cardinal Marx certainly got everybody's attention in talking about how to contain costs in the Vatican. Uh, several proposals coming up helping the various offices do multi-year budgets. So it's not just from year to year, but we can sort of get a long-term plan of five or 10 years down the road. Also, um, uh, Cardinal Marx brought out the possibility that all the offices have job descriptions uh, for each of their positions to see if there's not some possibility of, of being more effective, of being some mobility in terms of jobs within the Vatican. He also laid out the possibility of, of sort of the pre-pensions of people going into retirement early. The establishment of this Privy Council five years ago was an important historical development for the Vatican. Even before the 2013 papal election, the cardinals in their pre-conclave meetings had requested that the new pontiff hold regular meetings with a small group of cardinals apart from the Roman Curia. And when the white smoke finally appeared, signaling the election of Pope Francis on March 13, 2013, the new pope immediately accepted the proposal and appointed a council of eight cardinals a month after his election. Its purpose is solely to advise him on matters of the church and to provide an outside perspective to identify what was not working and suggest changes. A few months later, the group of eight cardinals welcomed a new member, the new Secretary of State, Cardinal Pietro Parolin. Henceforth, they've become known as the C9. And ever since, the C9 has met regularly with the Pope to reflect on the important decisions of his pontificate and to be the channel for him to gather information, perspectives and opinions, giving him a truly global view of the different issues that concern the government of the Catholic Church from different viewpoints. At the moment, the Vatican tells us the Pope has no immediate plans to add new members to the Council, but since the next gathering of the Council will take place in February, we might find that things may change soon after that. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. And earlier this month, the Pope issued yet again the, his monthly prayer intention video, the last one for the year for this month of December. 
The Holy Father is inviting us to join him in prayer for those who are involved in the service and transmission of the faith, that they may find in their dialogue with their culture a language suited to the conditions of the present time. Have a look. Si uno quiere compartir su fe con la palabra, tiene que escuchar mucho. Imitemos el estilo de Jesús que se adaptaba a las personas que tenía ante él para acercarles el amor de Dios. Recemos para que las personas dedicadas al servicio de la transmisión de la fe encuentren un lenguaje adaptado al presente, en diálogo con la cultura, en diálogo con el corazón de las personas y sobre todo escuchando mucho. Now, each month since 2016, the Pope has been sending out these prayer intention videos, asking the faithful to join him, praying for a wide variety of intentions. At first glance, it seems that these monthly intentions are random. They're good and worthy causes, of course, but random nevertheless. But what's interesting, if you look closely at the Pope's intentions group by year, you begin to see that they are in fact being driven by underlying themes. For example, in 2016, the series begins with a request for prayers for interreligious dialogue, then another month, care for the creation. In November, the country is receiving refugees, then for indigenous peoples, then it ends in December with prayers to end child soldiers. These are all themes in Catholic social teaching. Then in 2017, the Pope seems to focus thematically on the struggle of people in their everyday lives. One month, he asks for prayer intentions for the elderly, another for artists in October for the rights of workers and for the unemployed then another month for the youth well you kind of get the idea in 2018 we then see another thematic shift with a distinct focus it seems on the prayers for the church or rather the institutions of the church for religious minorities in Asia in January to the mission of the lay in May to the priests and their pastoral ministry in July then to this month of December in service of the transmission of faith and if the Pope continues releasing his monthly prayer intention videos in 2019, and I personally hope that he continues to do so, it'll be interesting to see what direction he'll take the theme for the upcoming year. Now, there is some interesting speculation as to what those themes might be, but at this point, it's anyone's guess. Now, being that this is the last episode of Vatican Connections for the year, it only makes sense that we take a moment and look back at the 12 months to review some of the tumultuous highs and lows that the Catholic Church has cycled through in the past months. And despite the difficult challenges that the Holy Father faced this year, 2018 was clearly a year that we witnessed the Pope hammering down in some key themes of his pontificate. Have a look. 2018 will be a year many U.S. Catholics remember as one during which Pope Francis and U.S. bishops confronted new scandals of clerical sexual abuse, as well as serious accusations of cover-up. But over the past 12 months, the Pope has also continued hammering home the key themes of his pontificate. Non sono solo la guerra o la violenza che li ledono. Nel nostro tempo ci sono forme più sottili. Penso anzitutto ai bambini innocenti scartati ancora prima di nascere, non voluti talvolta solo perché malati o malformati o per l'egoismo degli adulti. Non è facile entrare nella cultura altrui, mettersi nei panni di persone così diverse da noi, Comprendere, comprenderne i pensieri e le esperienze. Avere dubbi e timori non è un peccato. Il peccato è rinunciare all'incontro con l'altro, all'incontro con il diverso, 
all'incontro con il prossimo, che di fatto è un'occasione privilegiata di incontro con il Signore. Pope Francis traveled internationally, visiting the Geneva headquarters of the World Council of Churches to celebrate the ecumenical body's 70th anniversary. Perdonarci tra noi, riscoprirci fratelli dopo secoli di controversie e lacerazioni, quanto bene ci ha fatto e continua a farci. Pope Francis also went to Ireland for the World Meeting of Families, and he visited the Baltic nations of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Pope Francis further internationalized the College of Cardinals, appointing new members from Pakistan, Iraq, Madagascar, and other nations. In September, the Vatican announced that after decades of talks, it had made a landmark but provisional agreement with the Communist government of China on the appointment of bishops. Pope Francis, uh, like uh, his immediate uh, predecessors, looks uh, with uh, particular care to the Chinese uh, people. In October, at the Synod of Young People, Faith and Vocational Discernment, some bishops, especially from Australia and the United States, insisted the abuse crisis be a topic of discussion. But the main focus of the month-long gathering was to find better ways to include, listen to, and assist young people on their journey of faith. And during the Synod, Pope Francis canonized St. Paul VI and St. Osco Romero, highlighting Jesus' call to leave everything behind and follow him. Now, looking forward into 2019, we see that it's also shaping up to be a very busy year for the pontiff, with a bunch of apostolic trips booked and confirmed that will take him all over the world. At this point, here is what we know for certain. World Youth Day in 2019 will take place in Panama this January from the 23rd to the 27th. And the Pope will be in attendance to partake in the largest Catholic youth festival in the world that happens every three years. And earlier this month, the Vatican announced that the Pope will travel for three days to the United Arab Emirates in February from the 3rd to the 5th in order to participate in the International Interfaith Meeting on Human Fraternity happening in Abu Dhabi. The theme of the visit is, make me a channel of your peace, and that's exactly what the Pope's intentions are in visiting that country. This visit, like the one to Egypt back in April 2017, shows the fundamental importance that the Pope gives to interreligious dialogue. Now, from March 30th to the 31st, we'll find the Pope in Morocco. The Holy See press office confirmed in November that, upon being invited by King Mohammed VI and the nation's bishops, the Holy Father would visit that country in March for a two-day visit that will take him to the cities of Rabat and Casablanca. Another papal trip was announced last Thursday, this time to Bulgaria and Macedonia, in May from the 5th to the 7th. The Holy Father had accepted the invitation of civil authorities and the Catholic Church in those two nations. And of course, I'll have more information on those trips when details become available closer to the date. Now, those aren't the only trips in the horizon for the Pope. It's still early and there's a lot of speculation about visits next year to Romania, Mozambique, Japan and Uganda, all based on what the Pope said in past conversations. For example, back in May of 2015, the President of Romania invited the Pope to visit and he agreed to do so. Then, this past May, when the, when the Pope assured the Prime Minister during her recent visit to the Vatican that he would visit in early 2019. Now, inside sources have said that the visit to Romania was postponed until possibly the third quarter of this year. But at this point, nothing has been confirmed, so it's just speculation. But be assured I'll keep you up to date as, materials, as details materialize.
Christmas week is always a busy time at the Vatican, especially for the Pope. Last week, the Vatican issued the schedule of the Pope's agenda for the Christmas season, and it certainly won't be a restful one for the 82-year-old pontiff. And Allison Kenny brings you the details. Thanks, Noel. In addition to celebrating his birthday on Monday, the Pope also celebrates a series of Christmas liturgies starting on December 24th and ending January 13th, after which he'll hopefully get to enjoy some well-deserved rest. Beginning with the Christmas Eve Mass from St. Peter's Basilica on Monday the 24th, the Holy Father will take part in six liturgies. On Christmas Day at noon, we'll hear the traditional papal message and Urbi et Orbi blessing from the central balcony of St. Peter's. Then, on December 31st, the first Vespers of the Solemnity of Mary, Mother of God, followed by the exposition of the Eucharist, the traditional singing of the Te Deum hymn in thanksgiving for the concluding year 2018, and the Eucharistic blessing. Pope Francis will kick off the new year on January 1st with the Mass of the Solemnity of Mary, the Mother of God in St. Peter's Basilica. It's also the World Day of Peace on the theme, Good Politics is at the Service of Peace. The Mass of the Solemnity of the Epiphany of the Lord will be in St. Peter's Basilica on January 6th, and the Christmas season officially comes to an end with the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord, which in 2019 falls on January 13th. The Holy Father will mark the occasion by baptizing babies during a Mass in the Vatican's famed Sistine Chapel. Now we'll be broadcasting many of these events, both live and at times that are more convenient for a Canadian audience. So for exact air times and dates, you can visit our website at saltandlighttv.org slash schedule. Back to you, Noel. And finally tonight, we go back in time to have a look at some of the historical events that happened this week at the Vatican. Well, I'm sure we all remember where we were when we first heard the news that Pope Benedict announced his retirement from the papacy back in 2013. And though it was a huge shock to the world, it wasn't the first time a pope resigned on his own initiative, which takes us to the year 1294. It was on December 13th of that year that Pope Celestine V advocated the seat of Peter. Sadly, however, his successor didn't treat him too well as a result of it. In the year 1294, Celestine was chosen to succeed Pope Nicholas IV by the College of Cardinals who needed to break a two-year electoral stalemate. At the age of 79, he only served as pontiff for five months before resigning, citing deficiencies of physical strength and the longing for the tranquility of his former life. Celestine was succeeded by Pope Boniface VIII, who ordered his imprisonment because he believed that two living popes might create division in the church. When he heard about the order, Pope Celestine went on the run and evaded capture for nine months. Eventually, however, he was caught and held captive at the castle of Fumont where he died 18 months after stepping down. Celestine was canonized on May 5th, 1313 by Pope Clement V, and his feast day is celebrated on May 19th. Now, interest in Celestine's short papacy was once again reignited when Pope Benedict made a pilgrimage to his tomb in 2009, only to follow in his footsteps almost 720 years later on February the 20th. 2013th rather, a day that I'm sure we all remember. Well, that's our show for the week, in fact, for the year, but we'd still love to hear your thoughts and comments on today's stories. So why not drop us a line on the Salt and Light Facebook page or on our Twitter handle listed below. I'm Noelle Okel. Thanks so much for joining us, and we will see you again in January.